I wanted to thank you all for sponsoring this evening, for coming together to do our St. Patrick's slash Jesus meets Aristotle dinner, philosophy dinner. The last time we did St. Patrick's dinner, those of you who were part of it, were present, it was three years ago, you might remember before COVID, in Tumi Room, and then the topic of our conversation was that hard book three years ago, it was a bestseller, uh, by Dr. Jordan Peterson about the 12 steps to uh, cure, especially maybe some of the ideas of masculinity and men to put some order in men's life. Three years has passed and we are back again. Last year we did St. Patrick's dinner, which was a little bit limited, but this one is uh, to full capacity, I guess, of our possibilities. But thank you so much for coming tonight. I would like to propose to journey with you through some of the ideas that you definitely have heard about, you are familiar with. Many of you might even read about some of those ideas. For some of you, it might be brand new, but that is why I'd like to paint some canvas first before we go to some specifics, details about this pre-Socratic, as we call him, philosopher Heraclitus of Ephesus, and then as we will withdraw from some of his uh, fragments, some of his philosophy, and see how it was definitely understood and adapted by the early Christians and even some of the fathers of the church. Let me begin also with this. 1973, was a very good year. Not only because Rolling Stones released Angie or Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon or Roberta Flagg, The Killing Me Softly or we can go on and on and on. I think the real music ended in the 90s maybe, I don't know. But, but uh, also a little baby boy was born in an obscure town of Czechanowiec in Poland that his grandmother, because he was anemic when he was born, hard to tell that now, <laughs> looking at me, his grandmother for weeks prayed to Blessed Mother to cure that disease, to let me live or take me right away so my family and I would not suffer. And she said, and I found this only after she died, she made that pledge to the Blessed Mother that if I would live, she will make everything possible that I will become a priest and preach her grace and her love to everyone. You know, I believe in those things. I believe in the supernatural because this is part of who we are, my friends. This is part of what distinguishes us from the animal kingdom. And we talk about this numerous times. You might recall, those of you who were present with us last philosophy dinner, in the fall, when we talked about evil, remember? And why Auschwitz happened, why Gulag happened, what provokes men and men's heart to sometimes be so evil? Because I believe when men and women are degraded to the level of animals only, that's what happens. We don't have no guidance whatsoever. We don't have, or our actions have no ramifications whatsoever. And in other words, philosophy of everything goes becomes prevalent. And tonight, I would like to journey with you, as you see on your handouts, those are in sequence, uh, and I will try to, of course, I didn't learn them uh, or memorize them by heart, but the handouts are just the references to something that we will talk about. I would like to explain why I believe studies of ancient philosophers, especially maybe not necessarily materialists, monists, but someone like Heraclitus and some others might help us even today, 2,500 years later, to relate to everything that goes in contemporary culture in the world today. Because we might think we are the geniuses 
that have discovered this and such, but in reality what we have discovered is only will and fire. <laughs> when you think about this, everything else is sort of accidental. <laughs> and I think, my friends, as you would look behind me, some of those foam boards, and I wish I uh, could have been better with computers uh, and put together those PowerPoint presentations and slides, but it would take me three months to put together one slide, so forget it. So I'm kind of old school, old style of the foam boards or whiteboards, if you wish. Uh, but I will guide you through it, so hopefully everything that you see behind me uh, will make sense, a little bit more sense, hopefully. But also, you see, in times like this, like today, I miss so much my favorite Pope, John Paul II, the Holy Pope. I put into the handout a little bit of my heart, poured out a little bit of my, not bitterness, but maybe a little resilience to give up, <laughs> and why we shouldn't, all of us, because I feel over the last several years that I am journeying during Lent and it never ends. Journeying or being in the desert, spiritual desert, for some time. I have not been able to come across a good, motivational, inspiring Catholic book. <laughs> I could not have come across some good, inspiring Catholic leadership. <laughs> and it pains me to say that but I miss my Pope, John Paul II, in times like this. And that is why, instead of maybe panicking a little bit, what is about to happen, I resource to his writings, and tonight, toward the end of our talk, second part of our talk, I would like to call your attention to some of it, particularly three of his letters, encyclical letters, on the Holy Spirit in the church and the world from 1986 to Veritatis Splendor, on the splendor of truth from 1993 and then Evangelium Vitae, the gospel of life from 1995. 30 years ago and counting, but those words are gems, my friends. I think we should resource to them very often because Pope very clearly prophesizes back then the classes that the younger generation, meaning us, we, will experience of so-called anti-logos and anti-veritas, anti-truth. And if you are open-minded, critical thinking person, you cannot just by deny that what's going on, not only in America, but around the world today, is anti-word, anti-logos, and anti-truth, given the example of Ukraine. Let me paraphrase a little bit, not for long, but you know very well watching the news and seeing what's happening, that in the eyes of Russian people, majority of them, and Mr. Putin, I will not call him ever since February 24th a president. Unfortunately, I'm sorry. But in their eyes, it's not even a war. It's not even an invasion. You know very well, logically and politically, to have war, you have to declare it first. They never did. In their eyes, it's a rescue mission for all the Russian-speaking entities and individuals in what would now be free country of Ukraine. So where is the truth? <laughs> Who speaks the truth? What is the anti-truth here? And I hope, given the same logical principles, when I heard the words of Kirill, Cyril I, the patriarch of Russian Orthodox Church a week ago, or so, when he was commenting for the first time after that bloodshed in Ukraine, and he said, of course, he is a Putin's crony and he is appointed by Putin, in a way. Patriarch of all Russia, of Moscow. He gives his reasons to justify that invasion, that war, and he even calls it metaphysical war because that war is against gay and all the LGBTQ and crazy people in the West. 
Therefore, it's justified, and Mr. Putin is the tip of the sword, edge of the sword, tip of the spear in that holy war against godless West. My God, I'm asking myself, and that is why I would like to talk about in that regard tonight, where is the truth? How come the agent of Logos, patriarch, for crying out loud, could distort that Logos, that word of God, so badly. <laughs> there is no recovery from it, as you know it, my friends. Those individuals will fade into nothingness very soon. But that's besides the point. What about you and me? But what about us? What can we do to still stand for the Logos, the word of God, and for the truth? That Jesus is ultimately. And I think talks like tonight, of course, of a nice dinner and a little bit of the Irish uh, colors here, uh, they can help us, I hope. Talks like tonight can help us to rekindle our faith, to strengthen our power of convictions, because sometimes we feel right. We are intuitive people, but we are not sure if this is in accordance, in agreement with the Catholic teaching, or even are those feelings okay? When I feel about what is happening, and I think by studying it, by reading some of those aspects again and again and all over, it helps us to become better agents of that word and that truth in the world where both are distorted very badly, very badly. But let me start <coughs> with Heraclitus, for he is, that's the second uh, uh, part of your handout or your folder, it's of course a very poor copy from one of the philosophy books that I use of Heraclitus, and many call him, he was born in what today would be the coastline of Turkey, uh, Ephesus, among many other places, very famous then for Christian culture in Ephesus in the first few hundred years of Christianity. But Heraclitus was born uh, a little bit more than 500 years before Jesus was born. So I hope you also understand that what he says and what we think he says have nothing to do with faith, religion, Christianity, Judaism whatsoever. Whatsoever. It's a completely different category, philosophy. And even more so, philosophy of so-called pre-Socrates. You all know, remember we talked about him many times, Socrates, that is the father of all philosophy. And you see... The phenomenon about him is that nobody denies his existence, right? I never heard one person, one scientist, saying that Socrates never existed. He never lived. But what we know about him is only from his student, Plato, who writes about Socrates in his so-called dialogues. Socrates never left anything written, and still, nonetheless, no one questions his existence. Think about Jesus. 500 years later, yes, he didn't write anything, possibly maybe with his own hand. We know about him from his apostles, followers, and even historians like Jewish and Roman. And why would we deny Jesus' existence? <laughs> from the very beginning, that existence was denied, and it continues. But I hope you see it, my friends, why it would be good for us to maybe before, if we go deeper into Heraclitus, you might feel, you might see that even what he says, when it's just taken on surface, if we do not do a little bit of a deeper homework on Heraclitus, we only scratch it when you think of it. We only see him maybe as very dark, very negative philosopher who says, what's the point? You are born and you are dying. You have no control of time. Your youth, say it goodbye. But what you see behind me, it's, it's the truth. It's what I think encompasses us as human beings and we cannot deny it. You know, the, the, the arrow of time and space, green and blue arrows on those white little foam boards, always move on, move forward. And we are along with them being the vector of, yes, love and accident, creation and eventually eternal life, 
But ask yourself a question. If time moves forward, why memories always move backwards? <laughs> why we miss so much? Or even think of the things that are horrible that happened in our past, but it always the vector opposite to what the reality is. And we can speak on and we can talk about the sciences of it on and on and on, but we will not have enough time to do this. But what you see behind me, my friends, is to your left with the first board here. I hope you see it. It's sort of like a blue and green arrow system, like the field or the vectors of space going horizontally and then time, of course, curving, going uh, vertically, right? You call it vertical and horizontal. And what you see as the black little dot here is something that in vernacular culture we try to call or we have been calling often Big Bang. That's what those letters B and B stands for. It's not bed and breakfast, right? In other more specific or more past high school education word for that phenomenon that happened and that's hence the number. You see how many zeros are after the comma? Only American debt is much higher than that number I can think of. But it's around, of course, not quite, but around 14 billion years ago when it happened. And we call it that event singularity. Super condensed energies eventually were freed <laughs> last talk, remember, we talked about this, some handouts and, and those lines about the universe. We won't go into detail because of the time restrictions. But I hope I see, I tried to put on that, on that line of space and time some of the very significant moments in the history and then moments in the religious thought that we might relate to. Book of Genesis, in first and second chapter, spe specifically in chapter second, verses 4 to 25, speak about or attempts to about that singularity moment. We call it creation, creation. And then the first archaeological, tangible history of ancient times that we can relate to are the times of about 13 years, 13,000 years before current or 11 and a half thousand years before Christ. Depends of the uh, stratigraphy, the, the terminology that you use or the timeline, but the two major events of that time would be the flood and above it you see in blue the name that is in Turkish language Gobekli Tepe, which is the most current discoveries in the land of Turkey, very close to Syrian border, that now are finally being described, elaborated, worked on, and we will have to change our ancient history textbooks in next decade because of the discoveries in those mounds in Turkey. Entire cities with some say temples, some say some ritualistic structures that are megalithic, huge, were discovered that predate Egyptian pyramids, and that's the next timeline spot here, by almost 8,000 years. 8,000 years. When you think about this land, Norwalk, Connecticut, 13,000 years ago, above us was about mile point two thick ice and snow cast. Only after, as we call it, one of those dryers, the drier, hotter seasons, when the icebergs, ice cap melted, the lands here, entire northern Europe, entire land of north, when the ice receded, were open for vegetation again, for life again. And then, my friends, when we talk about the faith, and that is why that 
space and time line gets a little bit more confusing. When we talk about Christ and year zero, we know he was born a little bit before, as we call it now, year zero. Internal and external resources tell us that. Biblical and extra-biblical resources tell us that. Jesus had to be born when who was alive, who persecuted him, remember? Well, Herod, Herod the Great. And Herod the Great, we know for a fact that Herod the Great died between the years 4 and 3 BCE. So you see, in order to persecute Jesus, receive the Magi and all that story, Herod would have to be alive. So we we'll live with that mistake, you see, of dating. And we will never recover from it because it's, in, it's impossible to undo the seals and the records and everything else dating back 2,000 years. But I hope you see how that time, my friends, that we are talking about gets closer to Norwalk, Connecticut here. Let's say in 2022. I hope you see it. 2022, Norwalk, Connecticut, right here. And then that's where we are. But going back to Heraclitus and all the philosophers that lived around his times, his age, about 500 years and closer to the year zero, to Christ, many of them were on the quest, on the search for something that in philosophy, in philosophical terms, we call arhe, arhe, simply the beginning the essence, the reason for existence, the most common denominator, what made everything, what is the beginning of everything we know. And many of them gave different answers to that question. Many would say it is something of a matrix, a perion would be the Greek word for it when Anaximander would say that. Empedocles or Thales of Miletus, you studied him in math class in sixth and seventh grade, when you did the geometrics of Thales, Thales, you call him, right? He would say water is the most common denominator. Some would say, no, it's fire. Some would say, no, it's the air. Some would say, no, it's the earth. You see, but then yet, right in the middle, and we still call him pre-Socratic because he lives before Socrates and then greater philosophical schools, gentleman by the name Heraclitus, the one that we would like to talk about tonight, says that, it is something that he uses the description, the word logos, to describe it. Logos, he says, which translates from the Greek language into something of our word, word, is the reason for all existence. It's logical, and he says it's visible only through experience of flux, or flow, or change, as we translate it today. And that change makes you realizing of what that Logos is. Is eternal, but yet also present in everyone, in everywhere. And remember, that has nothing to do with Jesus or St. John's Gospel and his prologue about in the beginning was the Word and Word was with God. And our He and whole Logos, you see, John uses the same language as Heraclitus 500 years later or plus about something completely, or should I say someone, completely different. But then maybe then some of the students of Heraclitus or pre-Socratics, like Plato, would have that intuition, that hint, that it has to be something so elusive, so abstract, that, it, that our head, that beginning, it cannot be me, it cannot be you, it cannot be anything I can touch or experience, it is the ideas, the world of ideas and the entire conglomerate of them. All the pool of ideas create that God, that Arhe, that origin and essence, the reason for existence. And that's Heraclitus. That's how this starts. And then I hope you see, my friends, that on this space and time vector, now I'd like to speak a little bit, talk with you a little bit about something that we call us, human beings. Because how we do, you and I fit in all of those deliberations, all those distinctions, all those beautiful, even philosophical 
descriptions of where we come from and who we are and what is our destiny. Heraclitus of Ephesus, that pre-Socratic philosopher, among many other things, said several statements, sentences, that people still are baffled by. That's all that we have of him <laughs> that survived. And when you, I'll just put it into circulation, when you look at it, those are just small little aphorisms and one pointers, statements, that eventually his followers will build into the system, the school of Heraclitus. If you can take a look, just pass it around. That's what we have of Heraclitus. Very limited, but then yet so intuitive, so insightful, that later on, when Jesus resurrects and his church, the followers of so-called the New Way, Conodos, called Nazareans, only later on Christianos, Christians, from the very beginning of that Christianity adopt. Justin, the martyr, who was one of the most prolific philosophers and theologians of those early years after Jesus, does something that we should thank him forever and ever and ever and ever. He adapts into the Christian thought, religious thought, everything that was good of ancient philosophy. You see, how genius, how intuitive it was. Not to discard it, not to see it as garbage or unholy or pagan, but to adapt what was good that would eventually form, create a vehicle for all the believers in Jesus to articulate themselves. Because imagine the confusion Perfect example of such confusion when you try to speak about the resurrection and Jesus and, and faith and all these to Greeks and Romans outside of Jerusalem and Palestine. Perfect example is the Apostle Paul. Do you recall from the Acts of the Apostles and some of his letters what happened to Paul when he was walking around what today would be just the beautiful ruins of Aeropagus, Athens' old city, with all the temples and all the altars and all the squares for public debates, all the life center of Athens. And Paul is walking around and walking around and seeing all the uh, altars devoted to, you name it, Zeus, Aphrodite, Athena, you name it. And he sees, Paul sees an altar that inscription on it says, to the unknown God. <laughs> and Paul tries to do something like later Justin and Origen and, and uh, Irenaeus of Lyons and many others, St. Thomas would do, to build on something that is tangible, visible, and you can relate to. But he is so misunderstood and severely, meet, uh, severely uh, beaten in the debate when you think about this. When Paul, recall it, starts to talk about that God who eventually would have a son, and son, God himself, would die and resurrect, those Greeks were like, Mamma mia, or maybe that's Italian, not Greek, right? Mamma mia, what is he talking about? How can someone who dies be alive again? It's, it's, so they, they, they tell him something that uh, I hear many times when I, am applying, when I am applying for black American Express card. Don't call us, we'll call you back, right? We don't want to hear about this anymore. Just go, just go away. But you see, that's the whole point, my friends. Paul, Jewish rabbi, and of course very well-rounded in Greek or Roman culture, could not deliver what only then later some of the Christian thinkers delivered. The study about the essence of who I am, who am I, who is, what is the human being, what is so important about me, why that Jesus, when, you know, like they try to reason, with it, why it is so important to understand that, yes, if he is the son of God, what do you mean by that? How then he would die for you and I? How that God, who let's say is his father, would be so cruel to send his son to die for all of you, humanity? 
And then those questions were millions of them, numerous. And the way they were answered, we call it now Catholic teachings, Christian doctrine, or tradition, or magisterium of the church. And one important part of such magisterium, my friends, is something that we call, where it comes to human beings, and importance of our lives, of us. It's called anthropology. Anthropon, anthropos, it's a Greek for man, human, human beings. Logi, of course, the study of it. And only Christian Catholic anthropology, study of human being, human existence, is affirmative one. It affirms entire human person with all the beauties and all the flaws, with all the good and all the bad. It affirms it because it says it has intrinsic, very internal value that is not based on what you have, where you live, the color of your skin or material status, but of who you are, the child of God. And you see, that is why our language ever since is now, especially ever since the French Revolution, is hated, disliked, completely deconstructed. Hence, post-postmodernistic deconstructionalist philosophy, they try to completely overturn everything, put it upside down, even redevelop the language so it serves ideas completely contrary to Christian teachings and even to some of those ancient philosophers. Hence, John Paul II and me mentioning him in the beginning, before, long before he became cardinal and pope, he was a village priest and philosopher. He knew both this and what you see behind you to your right. He was philosopher and Catholic priest. He understood very well that in order for this message, all of this, all of that you have been studying for all your years and praying for this message to be understood in contemporary language. And remember, Pope has the experience of what many people will have today in Ukraine of war, real destruction, second war, second world war. He says, how can we even talk about God to others after experience of such atrocities when man kills man only because he doesn't like the color of his skin or ethnic, ethnic background or you name it. How come? But yet that Pope says, before he becomes Pope and then later as a Pope, says it so beautifully. The forces of evil that he traces, and we will see it a little bit later, to Satan himself, the deceiver. Remember how Satan is called in this book, in the book of Genesis? The deceiver, the serpent, the father of all, li all lies, right? Like on the pages of the New Testament, the liar. And then Pope says, and that is why in contemporary world, when human being, human heart is so lost, forces would try to even would try to even redevelop our language to be anti-truth or anti-logos, anti-word, very creative, life-giving, so it supports the ideas that you and I are only animals. No different from your puppy. But that's not the case, not the point, and you know it, my friends, by how to argue it today with the younger generations. And that's the challenge. And going back to our board, speaking of the human person, you see, of the human being, from the Catholic perspective, Christian perspective, we speak about the entity that is comprised, that, is, that consists of two very distinguished elements of material body and immaterial, immortal soul, right? And then the faculties that we can trace to soul would be, of course, intellect and will. But then yet, between the soul and the body, we have something that traces back to that Garden of Eden called the Tree of Knowledge. Tree of Knowledge. 
And the fruit of that tree, and even Bible says that philosophers do too, is very bitter. Right? Truth always is very inconvenient. And then yet when you think about the tree of life, uh, I'm sorry, tree of knowledge, it comes to something we call uh, our choices. Every day we make hundreds and hundreds of choices, either for good or for evil. Sometimes we stay neutral. But then yet, I hope you see it, my friends, that here between the good and evil, intellect and will, human person is encompassed, embraced by something that those philosophers and early theologians, Catholic thinkers, would say free will, a natural law, but also through numerous, very many limitations, the factors that would impact free will. I would argue after St. Augustine, an Augustinian philosophy, that free will exists only in so far as you make singular decision. It's nothing, something objective, something you're born with, something that you're graced with. No, it's a completely different category, but that's just me and particular philosophy that I feel my intuition tells me is, is, has the right answer about free will. But remember, we talked many times when we stop here about the human being with all the limitations and possibly good free will and decisions we have to make. Remember we talked about something that is now in the making and it is gonna be very, very visible and very aggressive in the next decade or so that I call, and many of the scholars who read about this call, quantum psychology and quantum psychiatry. When you would look at this little whiteboard to your right about some ideas of what science is and what it is, is not, isn't, what science is not, we people who maybe like to think critically right away would see that even science, even though it claims to be religion of the 21st century, even science have borders, internal and external borders, limitations, you see. Even science cannot explain the deepest mysteries of human's heart. And therefore, I hope you see it, my friends, that, or you can make that connection, that in between those free will, limitations, good, evil, intellect, and will, what we do is either determined by what then? Our genes? You see where that quantum psychology and quantum psychiatry would go? If I am predetermined by my genotype, it's never my fault. You see, whatever I do, something or someone, even in my distant past, made me do it. <laughs> and that's the difficulty of it. And that's where we go. Another surface level of such thinking is the language that we try to scratch, talk about today, starting with Heraclitus and his Logos, language that for 2,000 years served us, helped us to distinguish right from wrong, good from evil, but now language that you and I will have to apologize for. Language that in Old and New Testament in the Bible will be completely canceled, eradicated. Maybe not this year, but it's just a matter of time, maybe decade, no more. Language about sin will be completely canceled from the New and the Old Testament. Because who are you to tell me what to do? You see, that's the conflict. That is why we should study philosophers like Heraclitus and many others, maybe in comparison with our Catholic Christian doctrine because of this, my friends. Each human person, regardless of religious or faith affiliation or lack of thereof, still would have a set of responsibilities and our lives will have a set of consequences of the way we live it. I just put few on the board 
that would maybe be more readable, more understandable for the person of faith. Responsibilities of human person would, I think, most of us would agree, would be visible in our behavior, in our dignity, maybe even for the people of faith in that supernatural life of grace or prayer. And then many, many other responsibilities that we bear but also consequences of our actions, our decisions, after decision, after decision. We cannot escape decision making. We can't. But I just put them into two categories of life and death. Each of our decision, I mean serious one, not what I'm going to have with my, uh, I don't know, salad, uh, blue cheese dressing or Thousand Islands, and serious decisions. And then what you see following the life and death, which would be the consequences of our decision making, it's not an Irish shamrock. I tried to make that infinity sign here and I failed, but I hope you see it. It's eternal. The consequences of our life, of us being human beings, of our actions are not only life and death. And that's where we stopped as Catholic priests speaking about that, stressing it. It's eternal. It's forever. Because even though Jesus comes and then delivers to us something that no one would ever think he would, the word of God, the logos, and we will go into some details about how maybe we can connect logos of Jesus with Heraclitus, an ancient philosophical thought of that entity, of that something that governs the universe and then is never conquered, always escapes our uh, knowledge that Jesus brings us resurrection, right? And today, in the 21st century, unless you are fundamentalistic Protestant, in the Catholic communion, often we stop saying that the resurrection has also consequences. It's not the resurrection period. You recall from the scriptures what Jesus says is the resurrection to life eternal or it's going to be the resurrection to eternal damnation, death. And that is why we stop talking about this because ever since I, I think 70s, maybe even earlier, Jesus and God became just kind of lovey dovey, uh, ever encompassing and everybody's loving entity. How mistaken we are when you think about this and how guilty many of us people who are ministers of the church and even into some uh, leadership positions were not only sinful and scandals, Jesus says about those people, it would be better for them if they would, remember, be never born. Would be better for them if they would tie a millstone to their necks and throw themselves into the ocean, into the sea, instead of causing scandal for those little ones, the little believers, children. You see? That is why, my friends, I hope you see it, uh, that even with my thick accent and then scarce journeys I try to take during this one presentation, I try to show you how important it is to always, always refresh, rekindle, and study our faith. In other words, if result, very tangible, visible result of how I believe, whom I believe, and of my faith is this, life or death, the consequences of my actions, of my living out my life. I hope and pray that you see it, my friends, that we, like Jesus, should love sinner, absolutely. Embrace him, try to help him or her to become less and less and less sinful. But we should never compromise with sin. Never compromise. Never condone, accept sin, absolve the sinner through God's mercy, but call evil for what it is. And you see, that's why we are 
maybe in some crisis as it is now because the younger generation especially is so confused. Imagine how we supposed to maybe talk to the younger generation about this. To your right again, the first whiteboard to your right. And I know it's a very small print, but we talked about this at least twice in our philosophy dinners. It's the definition or vision of the human person according to Catholic tradition, Catholic teaching. And we can distinguish some characteristics of who the human, what the human person is on the very three distinguishable, visible levels, scientific, philosophical, and religious. And only as the stained glass windows of all those three components, we can say something real about human being because if we do not include all three at least that's the minimum that that picture that vision of the human person will be flawed because it would be either very materialistic i'm just but a number nothing else matters just my productivity if i do not produce gdp what is the reason for my existence here if it's only, if we neglect that, deny that, and only turn to philosophy, maybe we become another Socrates, who eventually will be killed because he's so annoying asking all those stupid questions, right? Not real, kind of detached from reality. Or when we only talk about religion and nothing else matters, very quickly we shift into the fundamentalism. You see, only when we try to at least, at least keep in our definition specificizing of who the human, what the human person is, those three levels of science, philosophy, and religion, we can maybe agree with St. Thomas Aquinas, Jesus, and, and all the philosophers before them and after them, that human being is the individua substantia of rationalis nature, individual substance of rational nature, with immortal soul, should I add. Why do I say this? Because, my friends, of something that no one would ever ex accept, uh, expect if not for uh, the author that we know him in the history now as John the Apostle. The one who possibly, we believe that he is the one who gives us story about Jesus Christ in addition to three other stories of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And here where philosophy and story about Jesus come together. Right here. With the person of John. John. You, and that's the reason I don't really bring the Bibles or the New Testament with me. Because you remember it by heart. You could recite it with me by heart. The prologue. The opening of John's gospel. Shall we try? In the beginning was the word. And... And then nothing was in the world without the word, and it was from God, right? And then if we, if you, if us, if we would try to read it in that Greek language, the language of the philosophers and the original language of John's gospel, of the manuscript, it would go something like that. And then last time I took some systematic Greek was at least 12 years ago. Was, uh, so I'm, I'm not really fluent in it, but I can get by. I would say, en arche, en hologos, en hologos prostonteon. In the beginning, I hope you hear it, arche, the beginning, en ho was logos, logon, logon, word, right? And my friends, why this is, as we call it, Copernican revolution in the Gospels? Because it links Greco-Roman world with the very abstract concept of who Jesus really is. The Son of God. Not particular God. Zeus, Aphrodite, Greco-Roman gods that play you on the chessboard. You are rich, you are poor, you die today. No, 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 maybe tomorrow. It's just this move, that move, right? No, it doesn't work like that. But how you, you see, remember, we talked about this just about 15 minutes ago. How you now talk about all of this 
for people to understand you, even speaking the same language, even being born in Norwalk, they would not, you see. Forget about Jews, even well-rounded in Greek or Roman culture, try to speak about this phenomenon of God and the Son of God and how that Word of God is begotten, takes flesh, so we can have the eternal salvation to non-Jews. <laughs> but you see, that's the whole point. And that's our fault, my fault, my fault, my most grievous fault. From the very beginning, Christians, followers of Jesus, a good percentage of them were the people that were very well rounded in the Greco-Roman culture, world, their own writings, their own philosophers, their own thinkers. It wasn't just all about Kardashians. <laughs> It was to the extent, of course, now when they dig out, even from Pompeii, you know, some of the stuff, you see how pathetic, how, how uh, inel it was. But then yet, they were people who were rounded and could understand when John says this, and arche and hologos, when they hear that word arche, right away they make the connection with their philosophers, with their thinkers. Oh, this Jew, this Jewish man, Johannian, he, he's speaking about the beginning. He's speaking about what we have been thinking about for 500 years and couldn't figure it out. <laughs> you see, that's how God, uh, that, that's how John connects Jewish understanding of Almighty Father Yahweh with the Greek or Roman world. Another exercise that you can do and bring that connection of John using the very word that Heraclitus uses to describe the reason for all being, for existence, for everything, as logos, as the word, John uses completely different words to open his gospel and speak about the beginning than this book, Genesis. In your handout, you have rather a thorough explanation of it, how in the Jewish mind, Bible opens with the word Bereshit bara Elohim et Ashamaim et Baharetz. In the beginning, God or gods created heaven and earth. But the word Bereshit, Hebrew word for the beginning, and the Arhe in Greek are completely different. And hence you have the last of those whiteboards. And then is the Genesis. That's the Greek translation of that word Bereshit, you see, in the beginning. Genesis. That's how the book is named after. Does it or does it not equal? Equals or equals not arche? This. I would argue not. John does this. Origin, Irenaeus of Lyons, Justin do that. They believe that's the genuine, original, Christian, Catholic thought completely different than Jewish thinking about the beginning. Because you see, in the Jewish thinking, what happens in the beginning? What was there in the beginning? Tohu and Vabohu. Those Hebrew words, you remember what they stand for? Chaos and darkness, right? Mess. According to St. John, what was in the beginning? Logos. The Word of God, you see how transcendent it is. It does not even touches on the process of making maybe uh, order from that chaos to cosmos, but completely above it, touching philosophically upon the essence of everything that is. And that is why John, instead of choosing maybe this word, Genesis, Bereshit, the, the very Jewish word that his own scripture, Hebrew scripture, book of Genesis starts with, in the beginning, John uses this word, Arhe, you see, to describe who that Jesus is. And as abstract concept as it is, because think of it, if you think, if you can think, close your eyes for a second and can think of, of God, how you see God in your own head, in your own heart, and then try to conceive in your head, logically, follow the concept, so to speak, that the Word of God takes human flesh, 
and we call him Jesus, I'm already tired. <laughs> it's inconceivable when you think about this. Absolutely. I mean, that, that, that's so abstract that there is no surprise that even today, many religious thinkers, philosophers would argue about this. But when you think about the process, thought process of John, when he is creating his story about who Jesus really is, that's why maybe John escapes what we read Christmas every evening from Matthew and Luke about Nazareth, about the stable, about the shepherds, and then Mary, and giving birth to Jesus. Yes, that's that part of it. Bodily, you see, very physical, very sentimental, very beautiful. But then yet when John says, but I would like to engage that Greek or Roman pagan so they believe in that Jesus, not only as a little baby born in Bethlehem, Maybe that is why, and that's what Origen says, Origen, Origenes, Adamanitas, you know, he lived only about 180 years after Jesus, or even less, and then he is very famous for, uh, for, among many, this book, I know it's as thick as the Bible, but it's called Against Celsus or Celsus, it is apology, Point by point by point, when Christianity is accused of being a sorcery, a magical cult, completely immoral cult, Origen, Origenes, refutes point by point by point those accusations here in this book and presents what the real Christian doctrine is. Only hundred and maybe fifty years after the resurrection of Jesus. Have you ever read this? So say mea culpa. <laughs> My fault, my fault, my most grievous fault. Yes, origin, originus is not proclaimed the saint of the Catholic Church because of different errors he made, especially when it comes to some of the scriptural interpretations or his idea of so-called universal salvation. Apocatastasis is called that he supports the, or supposedly supports the idea that at the end of times, when the resurrection happens, some to hell, some to heaven. Origen argues that no, it's going to be resurrection only to heaven if at the resurrection people will still want it. Even Lucifer, even Satan itself, Origen says, will have a chance to be redeemed. <laughs> well, that's, that's too much. That's why he was never made into the, the, the Catholic uh, church as a saint. But then yet, my friends, what he speaks uh, of, how Origen puts that beautiful story of of the word of God into public, into his adversaries, is amazing. Maybe that is the reason that those fathers of the church had that intuition to speak about John, why John uses completely different philosophy and wording to describe the beginning. Because you see, for Jewish people, and that is the reason maybe that uh, Bible is very misleading or can be very misleading, because it starts, it opens with the account of creation. It gives an impression that the Bible or the book of Genesis is cosmology, is a cosmological book or physics book, how it was created, heaven and earth. And people until today try to decipher, you know, seven days of creation or, or this or that or find the paradise, the rivers in it and all this. Pointless. Because entire blueprint, entire canvas for the Pentateuch, Torah, the law of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy is to create, describe, create a blueprint for perfect temple in heaven. Or in other words, maybe describe perfect temple in heaven and try to build one on earth in Jerusalem. And they did. You see, that's the only reason of the Pentateuch when you think of it. It is not, or those books, or the Bible is not physics book is not chemistry book, is not mathematics. Yes, it speaks about all those things, but most of all, it is a religious book. And then it's maybe very unfortunate that they have arranged the much later arrangers, editors, arranged the Bible in such way that it opens with the book of Genesis. The beginning. Maybe it should have opened with the book of Exodus and the story of Moses. And why? 
and who Moses is and why all these things are happening to him and why Moses is chosen to accomplish something going kind of back and forth I don't know but I believe that because of how Bible opens it gives very misleading erroneous impression that it is cosmological in nature Bible is not it is a religious interpretation of primeval history ancient history and historical times nothing else word of God yes absolutely inspired holy but for a specific reason and only then I hope you see my friends why John opening that Jewishness that understanding of all that John understands about the Jewish faith he says it's not gonna work with pagans with Romans Greeks you name it that's why John addresses his listeners the way he does with that opening including in it this so close to Greek philosopher Heraclitus that I believe that today today comparing both John and his elaboration on the Word of God and doing a little bit of homework applying ourselves it can be prolegomena it could be propedeutics it could be the beginning the introduction for us to reconcile this to the right of you that board about the science maybe Heraclitus and his logos and logos in John's gospel can give us clues to very logically argue with contemporary subatomic physics for instance because what those theories theories tell us that when we go deeper and deeper and deeper into the subatomic levels that the movement causes what existence appearing those electrons exist only as far as they move when it's static it's decay we talked about this last time remember about natural evil and supernatural evil the state of the natural evil is death decay law of entropy we're going to die <laughs> but spiritual evil is completely different you see it's moral morally oriented but then yet when we try to think about philosophy of Heraclitus who elaborates on the logos as the arche as the principle that is visible in the change in the flux how intuitive it is 500 years before Jesus two and a half thousand years before Einstein or Heisenberg or the uh, Danish uh, mathematics or physicians how intuitive he is that it has to do something that origin that that common denominator the most universal experience has to do something with movement with change you see that's what contemporary physics theoretical physics tells us today I hope you see it my friends and it still did not discover did not create did not do what remember we talked about this we can speak about I think with certain 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 I, I think validity about certain uh, elements of the subatomic fields bosons being category of it in other words those interactions between very very subatomic particles and one that eventually would made all this possible in other words make things happening being Higgs boson although now defined to something specific they cannot create it made it yet and maybe it's a good thing because if they do maybe that's gonna be causing us a black hole as we know it here in this uh, part of the universe I don't know but I hope you see it my friends that for us as people of the 21st century Catholic Christians we have tools beyond our imagination we just have to dig them we just have to go back to them to those resources that can help us to engage today as it is in a more serious discussion than just should I say mass in Latin according to the Tridentine right of Pius the Pope or should I say mass in vernacular uh, language facing people it's not the point of discussion the point of discussion my friends and bringing back some 
sense, sanity, and the and fire, I believe, into our faith are between this and this. In other words, when you think about this, uh, this famous philosopher Heraclitus, he, among many other sayings, he is famous for that, that statement, that sentence that you, saw, you see here in the green. Everything changes, flows or is in flux, and nothing, absolutely nothing remains. And you cannot step twice into the same stream, the same river. In other words, in Greek language, that famous phrase opens with the words panta rei, actually hore, panta rei, kaioden menei. It's, it's, it's a rhyme, it's always rhymes. You know those aphorisms, that, those little statements that you see in the booklet, they are, it's actually poetry when you, when you uh, try to see it. In the language you hear it, language spoken you hear it in English, translations don't rhyme, of course. But saying something like this, Saying something like this, the valid question, I think, that we can pose to or to engage someone who is a person of faith is this, okay. So if, if uh, Heraclitus, that obscure man from antiquity, 500 years before Jesus, still uses the words that we can find only in St. John, you see, no other evangelists, St. John, Logos, the word, and then giants of the church, church fathers pick it up and elaborate on it, shouldn't we also maybe ask ourselves, so is that panta everything, like God has created everything out of nothing, equals cosmos, order or not? Those questions first, initially, might seem as making not much sense, but when you try to answer them, and when you try to answer maybe the question that we posed a little bit earlier, is the Hebrew word, Hebrew word opening the Hebrew Bible, in the beginning, Bereshit bar ah Elohim et hashamayim et haaretz, in the beginning God created heaven and earth, then Septuagint, Greek translation of those words, Jewish people translated into Genesis, not Arche. Why? If Arche is the beginning, you see, philosophically speaking, the original quest of where universe, you and I, where all this comes from, what unites us all, what makes us us, me, live, why then that difference? Why then Greeks translate the Hebrew words about the beginning of the word of creation with that word, Genesis, instead of that word, Arhe. And only then, I hope you can see, my friends, that when we seriously, seriously try to talk about, about our faith and about sacred scriptures and about why even maybe John uses this instead of that and what are the consequences, you see here, of it, only then you gain a very powerful tool because you strengthen your conviction and strengthen your faith in something that is here and in John, in here, in the life eternal. How John describes that everyone who believes, remember that John 3.16, that God has sent his only begotten son for this world to this world so everyone who believes in him might not perish but have eternal life. But my point is, my friends, my point here is this. Pope John Paul II, for entire 40 years or so of his life, was doing professionally as a teacher and thinker of what we are doing here in those philosophy dinners, you know. Studied all this ancient philosophy, scriptures, Catholicism, to come with, with, with something that you see on, on those pages of the handout uh, through his encyclical letters with the ideas or maybe even very practical propositions of how Catholics can defend that ancient tradition and the validity of it because it worked for 2,000, 3,000 years. Why do you think that it's not going to work now or Marxism would work instead of it? Even on logical way of thinking, it's, it's, it's very risky fallacy when you think of it. But I hope, my friends, that 
the first encyclical that you see, and only a few points from it, is from uh, that encyclical letter on the Holy Spirit in the modern world from the 80s. And remember also, that was after what happened to the Pope, John Paul II. He was shot, right? Real, not theoretical, not philosophical attempt on his life or Catholicism, but the very real one. And I hope you see analogy here. Would he be bitter, cynical, completely fall down, gave up? He would never do what he did after that, you see? And that encyclical and many others are after that attempt. And it doesn't matter how you would like to explain of that act of violence, of attempt on someone else's life. It's always anti-word and anti-logos and anti-truth, anti-human when you think about this, anti-life, anti-Christ, anti-Christ. You see the analogies today with the war going on and what truth is peddled and used by propaganda of the Russian people and their mindset and how the real ordinary person who at least critically can think reason sees it how you justify killing of innocent children and women and elderly I'm not talking about soldiers right how you justified in 21st century forget about the problems of this country Chicago, Baltimore, New York, Norwalk even. Crime, killings. Pope says it is because we have allowed ourselves to be lured and deceived by whom? He called him very clearly like the Bible does. The father of all lies. The father of all lies will never stop. He will support even movements, Pope says, on the pages of those encyclicals to completely deconstruct reality, to create alternative one so people feel better in that one because they feel uncomfortable with the Greco-Roman ancient tradition. You see now why such movements, even in schools now in the West, take traction, take off only because someone feels like that. Entire world, universe, is created, deconstructed to support that feeling. I rest my case. I hope you see it. And then Pope says there is still hope, you see. There is still hope because of the people like you, and I humbly think of me, and many, many others, because we can do that. We can go back to sources that always gave us strength to create something that Pope calls eventually very positive, very, he calls it Christian, Catholic anthropology. And then he says that he does this partially because of this gentleman. And this book, I'm just gonna put it uh, into circulation. It's one of the, one of the books, <coughs> collection actually of, of talks, and then uh, classes from different universities uh, by the gentleman German uh, philosopher, phenomenologist, and then existentialist Max Scheller, who came with, and we talked about him some time ago, you might not remember, but in one of my philosophy talks online on our web page, website, you hear about him, Max Scheller and his new anthropology, that, that uh, Pope John Paul II says it's very affirmative. It affirms all this, you see. Entire person does not only affirm nice and tall with the handful of hair and very healthy with no diabetes, with I don't know, million dollars in the banking account. No, it affirms everyone. It affirms even more so the poorest of the poor that let's say Mother Teresa would just cash out and go to India and start entire order to serve. You see? But I think you see it, my friends, because you are people of faith. It's a given for you. But how much you can do speaking like that, resourcing to this, all of this that we are talking about, you are studying when you engage someone so confused today, 
how much you can ignite the little spark in their heart of entering, jumping in, on a journey, you know, to walk with Jesus. And I think also what Pope says, because of people like you who are not afraid, who would rather lose their life than compromise against evil and sin, there is still hope. And Pope calls it for what it is, that entire culture, and that comes then, therefore, to more encyclicals as a follow-up of the early ones, like Veritatis Splendor, the splendor of the truth, and the Evangelium Vitae, when Pope brings some classic like this, Heraclitus and the others, Aristotle, Plato, ancient philosophy, contemporary philosophy, even sciences, then in an encyclical that you don't have the leaflet, the page on, like for instance, Fides et Ratio, Faith and Reason. You see, because I do believe that, that bringing back ancient Catholic, like Pope does believe, philosophy, now with the developments of the modern sciences, especially of the physics, modern physics, we can really purge purify many of the mistakes that Catholic Church has been making or living with for centuries, centuries. Do you, are you familiar with the name Galileo Galilei, right? Do you remember what happened to him from your studies, from your readings, right? He supported whom? Proud Polak, who was also on index. They didn't publish his book only until uh, after he kicked the bucket. Nicolaus Copernicus, right? Yeah, he published the book by the name De Revolutionibus Orbium Celestium. Latin serves you well, I hope. Revolutionibus on the revolutions of celestial orbs, bodies, right? Where he changed completely Ptolemaic thinking that the earth is in the center of the world, that it is the part of nature of all of this, and it revolves around much greater forces we don't even know or understand. Because he died before he was condemned. Galileo, on the other hand, was condemned. And he was kind of in a house arrest. It wasn't really that, that bad when you think about this. But remember who cleared him? and even pursued maybe for the case of his canonization, beatification. Galileo, who was on the index, who was condemned. Which pope? What pope? John Paul II. Yes, absolutely, like many others. Because I think the real humility, especially intellectual humility, is visible in something that pope did many times. I feel sometimes too many, way too many, but say, I was wrong, I'm sorry, please forgive me. <laughs> Isn't it Christian-like, Catholic-like, always has been? But look what happens now with anti-logos and anti-truth, anti-word culture and anti-truth culture. It's not my fault. And you hear it from early age on the field, soccer field, baseball field, you name it in your choir, right? <laughs> Ms. March Kelly, that person, that, that little beautiful baby cannot cannot hear a note or play it right, and you say, oh, it's not your fault, right? <laughs> Mea culpa. <laughs> My fault. But we do this out of love. We don't want to hurt anyone and all this. But it starts at early age. And when you hear it for 1, 5, 10, 20 years, it's not your fault, then you believe it. <laughs> it's not your fault. <laughs> and I hope you see now why I mention and what I say now quantum psychology and quantum psychiatry would have traction, already has, and what it creates for us, for Catholics, for people of faith. Crisis of what? Of already something that is questioned and in crisis, which is this, free will. And then what else in the third chapter of the book of Genesis? Original, if it's not my fault. <laughs> you see the domino effect then? Unless we are proactive, proactive, un unless we study all this again and try to come up with coherent, absolutely coherent response to the deconstructive philosophy of 20 and 21st century, we are in big trouble. Because what's going to happen is we will be reactive instead of creative. Like after 
Luther and his reform, reformation, beautiful Jesuit order, is reactive. It's the reaction for what already has happened and all the damage. Why repeat the same mistakes, you see? That is one of the reasons I, I love when you come here, my friends, and we talk about this and we try to argue and we try to uh, develop some new ideas or even talk about something that is uh, or was once maybe non-kosher. Like, for instance, in the opening statements of the handout today, I bring again, bring back again the person and the thought of someone who was banned, forbidden from teaching at the universities and talking and even publishing his books for many years. French Jesuit philosopher father Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, who among many other things would come with that idea that all this, my friends, from our head, from the beginning to possible end, is a journey from point alpha to point, to point omega, omega, again from Greek. Recall when it's used three times in the New Testament? 20, I believe, one chapter of the book of Revelation. I am the Alpha and the Omega. Time and eternity belongs to me. I don't, you know, getting old, I, I don't remember by heart anymore of those passages that I used to once. But, uh, but you all know it. We all read it around Easter, Easter time. I am the Alpha and the Omega. How intuitive that friend Jesuit was to even say that it is that, you know, you say it now and some of the uh, Catholics or priests who are not even thinking or talking about all of this, but in their mind, something that they believe will fix the state of affairs today in the Catholic Church is saying the Mass in Latin. And I have nothing against that. Absolutely, go ahead. But if they think that's the cure, they will never, they will say, I am a heretic when I say after Teilhard de Chardin about the cosmic sacrifice of Jesus on the altar of the universe. <laughs> Those are beautiful, almost poetic words. But when you think about this, isn't that true? On the other hand, when you ask yourself the questions, did Jesus and his resurrection when he came, he died for everyone or for just some people? For all? Absolutely. That's what scripture, that's what Paul says. But on the other hand, how come then our missionary activity, missions, you know, proclaiming Jesus to the most distant cultures and places, stopped for some reason, reached some sort of equilibrium, status quo, and there is still five billion people, give or take, that are not Catholics, Christians, maybe never heard about Jesus. How come? In the 21st century. We stopped this because we don't want to offend anyone and say, unless you believe in that Jesus, you will never enter what? Never. Always has been, that's what Jesus says, and always will be, the motivation for our missionary activity. So everyone at least will have a choice, <laughs> a choice to, to choose, you know, either believe in Jesus or not. But think what is happening. Deconstructivism, philosophies of 20s and 21st century, especially that post-postmodern deconstructive philosophy like Jacques Derrida is one of the agents of it. And many, many others, there's no time to mention them, but how they try to convince everyone about the possibility that 7 billion people in the world have 7 billion subjective truths. And who are you to tell me what is right and what is wrong? Completely, completely diffusing, mixing the levels of expertise, of talk, of philosophies, but then yet, I hope you see it. Let's say in that, that person that is born today in the Himalayan kingdom of Bhutan, right? Most likely would become Buddhist or maybe uh, in a broader spectrum uh, Hindu if the influence is there. Will never enter the kingdom of God 
most likely that person in obscure village in Bhutan will never hear about Jesus and all of this we talk about. So how come? Did Jesus die for that person or not? You see, my friends, and if that's not the burning zeal in your heart, you know, to do at least the best you can around yourselves, not to go to Bhutan to be a minister or, or missionary, Mother Teresa says it very clearly, and I think she saw a thing or two around the world, that the real love begins with the taking care of the people close to you, and that starts at home, in family. If she is saint, if she's holy today, I believe she has some insight, some intuition of how to become holy, you know, how to serve that Jesus. And then that's why maybe she would say from time to time when a question about all those uh, famous reporters, celebrities and something, oh, I would go with you to serve in Calcutta for three months to give meals and band-aid all the leprosy of all these poor people. And she would say, go home or stop smoking or, you know, go home and love your wife or children. And that's your mission, you know. <sighs> call me naive, call me a, a, a village very sim simple priest, but I do believe, my friends, that through common effort uh, and the talents that God gives us, we can accomplish what Pope is saying on pages of those encyclical letters. The beautiful one about human life, Evangelium Vitae from 1995. You probably long time ago have read that encyclical or parts of it, but how fierce is the Pope's protection, defense of human life. He says, it can never become the mean to an end, or end to a mean. It's completely different categories, because Pope believes in all of this, you see. Condone, supports all of this that we talk about. But unless you believe that only that part about the human person, to your right, the blue one, the science, materialistic, scientific part, is true, real, nothing else matters or is real or exists? Well, yeah, why not? We can kill whomever we want. Doesn't matter because you're like an animal. You are born and you will die. You eat, sleep, go to work. How different you are than your puppy then? <laughs> you live a little bit longer, a big deal, right? Turtles live three times longer. <laughs> but my friends, that is why, that is why uh, in a very simple way, somehow, I'll try to bring those incentives to you. So even talking about maybe connecting the dots, you see, making those memories against the arrow of time, the time that is so, the time and passing of time to me, like maybe to Soren Kierkegaard, uh, brings angst, that anxiety, that, that feeling that I cannot control because I feel it from time to time. Very tangibly, COVID made me realize how dangerous that arrow of time is, how much of an edge it has. When, you know, I see now some of the parishioners, and especially children, with no masks after two years or plus, how have they changed? How, how we will never regain that time, you see? And then, only then, I hope you see that, that, that not wasting it, doing something every week, every month, every year, even talk like this over a nice dinner, I hope will help us to rekindle that love for Jesus Christ, for our faith. Because if Jesus says something like he does, I am the truth and the way and the life, and everybody comes to the Father only through me. There is no other way, you see? He means that. And he does not say, I am one of the many ways. Go to Tibet. It was that good movie with Brad Pitt, I believe, seven years in Tibet. Go and experience. Go to Brazilian, uh, Brazilian forest, rainforest uh, jungle and hug the tree. <laughs> experience what's that like. He doesn't say do this or that. He says, I am the truth. I am the way. He does not say, I am one of seven billion truths. <laughs> Go check out and, and come back if you agree with me. 
wouldn't be Jesus, you see. But I hope you see it too, my friends. Even though this world is completely fixated on pleasure or making every single one happy <laughs> or comfortable or not hurting my feelings. And yes, that can cause depression, even suicide, even something. But that shows you the weakness of that condition. If my comment... If my mean tweet causes you to jump off the bridge, oh sweet Lord, you weren't right in the head in the beginning, to begin with. I hope, I hope you see it. And then tragedy is that that threshold, that that strength, that that fiber that men, women once have been is completely deluded now. If you care about the future of your grandchildren, Keep fighting, keep on, keep on fighting for them because that's all we could do. And I think this, one of those talks, dinners, getting together and, and strengthening ourselves about those ideas, building the library, re-dusting off a little bit of what we once knew, I think it helps.